actually a very, very long time ago. I was at SOAS in the 70s, and I've been hanging around the area more or less ever since. <laughs> Not progressed very much. And um, uh, I mean, I remember the Pakistani students protesting about the bombing of Baluchistan, the Indian students marching against the emergency, and so on. So there is a long, proud history of student activism that um, challenges the governments and the human rights violations that are going on in uh, the countries back home and also um, also has the opportunity to speak to each other across these national boundaries which don't always exist uh, you know back in uh, India or Pakistan Bangladesh even Sri Lanka Nepal I mean how often does one meet people from even the neighboring countries um, and I don't know if most of you have grown up here or where you actually you know, come from the Indian subcontinent. But um, they're different narratives generally that people carry with them. But the Hindutva narrative, as Ibesh explained, has embedded itself in both populations that have come from India and uh, people of Indian descent who've grown up in this country. And that's because, of course, the Hindutva movement in this country is a very, very long established and very considered a very respectable movement which has widespread social support and widespread cross-party support uh, in parliament and where uh, the version of the RSS or the HSS abroad is established as a long-standing charity in this country. Uh, so it has all the benefits of um, the charitable tax status uh, and so on. And if, if I have time, I'll uh, talk a little bit about some of the implications of that. But if not, then if you're interested, you could ask me uh, about that later. Now, I think, um, uh, I, 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 Ed, thank you for your story, because I really didn't know it. <laughs> I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And, and also, um, you know, I, I completely agree with Debesh's, you know, his general um, the sort of lineages that he, he's read, uh, uh, put out. Um, but one of the things I want to say is that when we look at Hindutva, we look not only at what's happening in India, but as I said, because these, it's not just here, but in America and other places, um, you know, some of the um, democratic presidential, the, you know, the candidates running in, uh, to be the next democratic candidate and so on have Hindutva links. These links are very high. They're not just government to government, Trump to Modi, uh, David Cameron or Theresa May to Modi. Uh, they're also within the grassroots movements, sometimes the, the progressive movements and so on uh, as well. And so it's important to understand in what ways Hindutva has both been a foundationally fascist movement. So I think we can all be proud as Indians. You know, I mean, there is always, you know, somebody like me, a gray haired old grandmother or grandfather sort of person who always says, you know, India, that's best, we did it best, or we did it first, or uh, in the Hindutva version, the Vedas are the fount of all knowledge and the perfect fount of all knowledge. Um, well, in terms of fascism, Hindutva rose side by side with the European fascism, what took from them, learned from them, uh, but was also conversely imbued its ideology within some of those movements, and which are active now in alt-right movements uh, uh, across the world. So there's a figure who uh, was actually related to uh, uh, somebody who some of you may have heard of, uh, a writer on the left, Shumanto Banerjee, uh, who, who um, has written about Naxalism and many other things, and writes for the EPW and so on. And he had an aunt uh, who was part Greek. Uh, she married, uh, she was a European woman, who married his uncle, settled in India, became an ardent Hindu, and not only an ardent Hindu, but an ardent fascist and theorized um, a sort of Hindu version of fascism with you know, uh, ideas of uh, sort of cyclical declines and falls and so on. And these ideas of hers were, uh, I mean, Shumanto told me that, he, that she had um, uh, gone back to Europe uh, late in life and I think was buried with honors uh, by the National Front for the British Fascist Party. Uh, but her ideas have spread all across Europe with her Greek origins, Golden Dawn, had picked them up and actually uh, uh, a journalist called Maria Maragonis found, found her through Golden Dawn and then tracked her back through her family connections and, and her life. And then found
found that she was appearing uh, in a lot of old right websites. Um, and as we know, the rise of uh, white supremacist far right is uh, increasingly threatening. And uh, you know, some of the Hindu far ideas have become embedded as part of their ideas. Um, so, so that so that's um, you know one one part of the Hindu movement. I think one of the things that we have to try and keep in our heads, because to understand what their language is, and I think Devesh gave lots of really good examples of it, and what's really interesting about it is that in spite of you know, focusing on the Ram Mandir and so on, a lot of the heroes and Ed, Ed's examples, they say they're, they're heroes who are not particularly religious. You know, yes, they have the figure of Ram and the figure of you know, the idea that this you know, this is, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's one text of the Ramayana and that this is the birthplace. And in fact, some of them have said that we want a Mecca here. Yeah, I mean, they, 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 they talk about it in terms of a monotheistic religion. Um, but they also, and I think this is the reason for grabbing on to the Ram myth, is that the idea of Ram, although in very, very different forms, is very well known and very beloved to a whole lot of devotional practice in India. And whereas Savarkar was himself an atheist and completely uninterested in these kinds of things, I think modern Hindutva has really tried to straddle the idea that it is a modern pan-Hindu cross-caste, in fact, sometimes anti-caste movement was not visible in its practice, but sometimes visible in some of its ideological things, at the same time as grabbing some of these devotional traditions and really turning them into something else. Um, so, so I, I, you know, and, and, and therefore it can be a lot of different things to different people uh, at, at, uh, at the same time. Um, but I think that one of the things when we talk about de saffronize is to do something that has become, at least in the Western Academy, and to some extent in some parts of uh, Indian academic thought, very, very unfashionable. And that is to talk about the value of secularism as uh, both as uh, part of the state, but also within societies, within social movements, uh, and within social practices. Um, and for a lot of people, because of the very fact that we've grown up uh, seeing what the failures of respective governments, you know, long before we're facing this as a new iteration of fascism, we're facing um, you know, extremely violent struggles or struggles violently being put down by Congress governments, uh, you know, all across India, uh, you know, there are the insurgencies in the Northeast and Kashmir, but there, there's the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, but there are also, uh, you know, states of emergency or virtual emergency in other la large parts of India. Um, there, and, and there are, have been horrific legal judgments, I mean, along with some very good judgments, but very horrific legal judgments throwing uh, uh, people off their land, you know, there's a, a judgment uh, uh, against Adivasis uh, on their lands and so on. And these fights would have been, of course, there anyway, uh, regardless of what government was in place. I think they've intensified and got much worse under Hindutva, but the idea of secularism has really faced a bashing both from the left and the right and the, and I don't know where to place them really because they can really appear on either guys, but uh, in a certain postmodern, modernist, postcolonial uh, discourse as something that is completely passe, something that is, uh, that is uh, Western imposed. Uh, so in fact, you know, really aiding a certain kind of Hindutva narrative. Um, uh, that, that uh, you know, different other kinds of uh, solutions uh, have to be found. Um, and so what I thought I'd like to talk about just a little bit to uh, uh, finish off is uh, that the, when the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was um, negotiated, uh, India had just become independent, Pakistan had just become independent, and there were Indian and Pakistani women at the table uh, of the negotiations of the UDHR. And they fought for a number of things, but key among them was the right to choice in marriage. And that right was something that had been developed by a women's charter uh, that had been developed in India by women of different backgrounds, uh, and which looks 
remarkably modern when you look at it today. Uh, and uh, Hansa Mehta, who was uh, on the negotiating committee and one of the few women on the negotiating committee, introduced the idea that uh, of all human beings are equal in dignity, and that's the language of the Universal Declaration. So if you say all men and expect it to include women, men will not include women. You have to put it differently. He argued with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, the, the idea of a right to choice in marriage was not part of the civil liberties, the Bill of Rights, or the European civil rights lexicon of the time. It was considered quite vulgar. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, again, didn't see it as necessary. So it's the people who are affected by child marriage uh, and so on who want to have this uh, 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 thing. And of course, in India, women had already fought again uh, across religious lines uh, for the raising of child marriage in 1929. There were also um, uh, uh, the Special Marriages Act, which allowed non-religious marriage. Now, all these acts, because the, the concerns of Hindutva and its predecessors in the Arya Samaj with Shuddhi movements, you know, bringing back to religion, purifying and so on, have been remarkably stable. I mean, again, I agree with Divesh that this idea that they moderate in power isn't there. And these, the, the issues of inter-caste, inter-religious marriage, the whole love jihad issue, the issue of um, bharvapasi, so it's not just a language of extermination. I mean, I actually, you know, uh, around this sort of postmodernist idea, uh, uh, I've seen quite appalling theses written abroad about Savarkar saying, oh, well, he wasn't mad. How can you call him a fascist? He was just, he just loved India and he loved Hinduism so much he was trying to convert people back to it. He wasn't exterminating. He wasn't like a Nazi because he didn't believe in exterminating Muslims. He was inviting them back into the, the fold. That's the, you know, this was actually, you know, a, a thesis that was argued at some length. Um, uh, so, so, which is why we have to understand the language. So these concerns have remained uh, stable. So it's not just the, the, the loud, uh, you know, the, 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 the ones that one hears about where people are burnt to death and so on for having an inter-religious marriage, but it is, the, it is the, the issues that arise were in court cases, when people register for a civil marriage, uh, uh, an inter-caste or an inter-religious couple, there have been cells in the courts that have been looking out for them. Babu Bajrangi, who's just been released on bail, he was very active in this movement, grabbing women, uh, trying to pressurize them, trying to get them to desist, a Hindu woman marrying a Muslim man, um, get, uh, getting hold of their parents and so on. So there's the, the big spectacular stuff, the lynchings, the murders, and there's the everyday stuff that goes on up and down the, the country in the district courts uh, and so on. And that is happening whether they're in power or out of power. Um, uh, so, you know, at the time, to go back to uh, the you know, late 1940s when the UDHR was being, um, uh, was being argued, uh, uh, I mean debated, it was the American Bar Association that was absolutely horrified by this right to choice in marriage. Why? Because it broke the, uh, the racial taboo of interracial marriage in America. It, it, it put a law above American state laws, which had, of course, many, many racial taboos. So if there was a huge anti-colonial, anti-racist movement of uh, black Americans, the NAACP, the Congress, uh, you know, the, the representatives uh, are at the table in India. Begum Ikramullah from Pakistan argued with the Saudis about the issue of choice in marriage uh, uh, and supported choice in marriage. Um, and, and the American Association of Anthropologists was similarly appalled because anthropologists didn't think that you know you should have these uh, these universal norms. They were a thoroughly bad thing. You know, you know, people progress in different ways and they have their own cultural norms and so on. So there was, you know, the opposition was coming from the great American institutions. That's it. And and I just want you to take that away and think about it as uh, a, a reason why we should be using the idea of secular values uh, when we seek to desaturnize. Thank you.